Welcome to NP Nerd. This is NP Nerd CWS prep course, and this is a sneak peek into the course. A little bit about me. My name is Lubaba Habash. I'm family nurse practitioner and a certified wound specialist. I work as a full-time mobile wound care nurse practitioner. I see patients in um, homes and ALFs and rehabs. The course outline, it has a total of 11 lessons, and lesson one is physiology of wounds, lesson two is definitions and normal values, lesson three is atypical wounds and lesions, lesson four is venous and arterial ulcer, lesson five is lymphedema and compression, lesson six is pressure on injuries, lesson seven is infection control, and lesson eight is diabetic foot ulcers. And lesson 9 is burns, lesson 10 is advanced treatment, and lesson 11 is wound assessment. So the first lesson, this is what we will be covering. Uh, the phases of wound healing, characteristics of inflammations, um, what are the factors altering wound healing, what makes a wound chronic, what are growth factors, and cells and proteins of the skin and layers of the skin. In lesson 2, it will have multiple definitions about a lot of words and um, that might be included in the test and then there will be normal values which are numbers that you got to know for the test lesson three has atypical wounds and this is a list of the all the atypical wounds and lesions that will be discussed in lesson three this is what will be discussed in level uh, lesson four it will be about venous ulcers and arterial ulcers as well as measuring abi and interpreting abi um, and interpretation of arterial doppler tbi measurements and tcpo2 measurements as well lesson five will be lymphedema and compression so we'll talk about mostly stages of lymphedemas um, what is a stemmer sign and what are compression types Lesson six will be about pressure injuries. We'll talk about stages of pressure injuries, deep tissue injury, shear and friction, and other stuff such as braid and scale, push tool, and different support surfaces. Lesson seven will be about managing infected wounds. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between critical colonization and infection. We'll talk about MRSA and Pseudomonas. And in this lesson also, we'll be talking about debridement, uh, the types of debridement, and um, what is a selective debridement versus a non-selective debridement, and so on. In lesson eight, we'll be talking about diabetic foot ulcer, which includes also risk factors, how to offload foot ulcers, the Wagner scale, which is a big deal, um, types of neuropathy. And in lesson nine, we'll be talking about burns as well as how to do and how to use the Lund Browder formula and the Parkland burn formula. Um, these can be on the test as well. Lesson 10 is advanced wound treatments that will be on the test, um, such as HBO, ES, UV light, and the wound vac. And lastly, lesson 11 will be about wound assessment, um, preparing the wound bed, uh, managing the tissue, infection, moisture, uh, product selection, what product to use for different wounds. So let's go ahead and do a sneak peek into this course. So when you log in the course with your username and password, you will get a list here on the left side that will show you all the lessons. The average of every lesson is about 20 minutes. Um, some lessons are a little bit longer. They're about 30 minutes or 35 minutes. Um, so this right here is lesson one. And I'm going to play a little bit of this lesson so you can see here I'm explaining the phases of wound healing, okay? of wound healing only apply to acute wounds, okay? These do not apply to chronic wounds. Chronic wounds don't go in order like this. Chronic wounds are stuck somewhere. They're mostly stuck somewhere here in the proliferation phase, okay? So these apply to acute wounds. So first stage, first phase of wound healing is hemostasis. That's the H, okay? The H is for hemostasis. That's when the wound is still bleeding, okay? The platelets are aggregating, and that's when you see vasoconstriction, okay? That is done by the body to control the bleeding. Here, the platelets are the main cells, okay? The star in this phase is platelets. You gotta understand, you gotta remember hemostasis, platelets are the main ones, okay? 
Now, the second phase of wound healing is the eye right here, inflammation, okay? This is two days post-initial injury. And here you're going to see vasodilation, not vasoconstriction. You're going to see vasodilation, okay? You're going to see redness, warmth at the sides, and that's where you're going to see neutrophils, okay? You're going to see them in this area running to rescue and they're going to come first and then macrophages will come after so in this phase of wound healing neutrophils are the star okay okay and then moving on to lesson two now this is the definitions and normal value lesson and this is a quick peek into the slide right here surfacing you gotta know that this is how partial thickness wounds heal Granulation, it's a formation of blood vessels and the synthesis of collagen and other matrix materials. A tissue that has healed from a previous wound, like a remodeled wound, will have 80% strength of the normal tissue, and this is called tensile strength. What anchors the epidermis and the, epiderm and the dermis together is pity regs. Dermis has two layers, papillary and reticular layer. So this alone, this slide has at least three to five CWS exam questions that might have, might pop from this slide. So this lesson two is all about that. It's just definitions of these words that will be um, questions on the exam. And lesson three is atypical wounds and lesions. And here is a quick peek on um, keloids and hypertrophic. What about keloids and hypertrophic? Um, a little picture here I want to share first. So keloid looks like this, you see that? And then hypertrophic will look something like this, okay? So now the keloid is a scar tissue that extends beyond the borders of the original wound. It grows outside the margin and over the incision line. So if you look here, you can't even see the incision line anymore because all this keloid is growing outside the margin. Okay, that's how keloid look like. Now, hypertrophic, on the other hand, it's also a scar tissue, but it's thickened within the boundaries of the original wound. So in hypertrophic, you can still kind of see where the incision was. Where they Okay. And moving along to lesson four, it's about venous ulcer and arterial ulcer. And here's a quick section about venous ulcer staging people ask when they see a patient with venous ulcer a lot of people in nursing homes will ask me and they will ask other providers too that okay so this patient has this wound on the leg and I see sloth in it so what stage is it and they will be thinking stage one pressure one pressure two pressure three pressure four and I'm like no 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 this is not how you stage venous ulcers, okay? Venous ulcers are, are not staged the same way pressure ulcers are staged. When, when a wound is venous in nature, you got to use this staging system right here, okay? So I have it here summarized. We got C1 is when you have spider veins, okay? Then that puts this paper. Okay, and the lesson goes on further to explain the underlined... Um, terms right here and with pictures so you can know what these are because they will pop on the test as well and then lesson five uh, a quick sneak peek here is when i was explaining the difference between lymphedema and lipedema is lipedema so lymphedema happens equally to male and female lipedema happens mostly in females after or during puberty okay lymphedema happens at any age um, lipedema, you know, usually it happened after or during puberty with females, so it's it, it does have it's it is kind of age restricted. Lymphedema has pitting edema. Okay, lipedema doesn't have pitting edema. See this picture right here. Lymphedema has can have cellulitis. It can it can include infection in there. Lipedema does not have usually infection. Okay, Ly lymphedema will have positive stemmer sign. Uh, lipedema will have negative stem or sign, okay? And lymphedema can happen in one leg or both legs. Um, lipedema is always in both legs. It's never going to be... And this uh, this lesson will further explain what's a stem or sign with pictures and um, how do you distinguish between positive and a negative one. Lesson six is about pressure injuries. And here's a quick slide as well. Shear and friction. They're not the same thing. 
So this, um, the CWS exam loves this question, okay? If you move a patient ipsilaterally, which means you move them in the, in the right direction, let's say you're moving the patient up in the bed, you're giving the patient a boost. So one, two, three, boost, that's how shears can happen, okay? Now, if you're moving your patient contralaterally, that means you're moving them from one place to another. You're moving them from the bed to the stretcher, for example, and then an open wound happens. This is because of friction. So that's the difference between shear and friction. Okay. And then we have lesson seven is about managing infected wounds. And this is also um, a quick e example of how the CWS exam tips look like in this course. So you got to know that they will try to confuse you in the test and they'll try to tell you uh, what's the slowest method of debrisment. They'll try to throw in their sharp debrisment, try to throw in their chemical debrisment and all that. Just remember autolysis is your slowest, okay? Because that's your waiting on the body. You're just sitting there waiting on the body. Now chemical debrisment now, let's talk about that. That's when you use silver nitrate. Um, silver nitrate, when you use that with a Q-tip, you see that on the tip of the Q-tip right here is some silver nitrate, and it is known as cauterization. It's used to debride wounds with rolled edges, such as epiboli. This picture right here on the right, this is an example of an epiboli. Well, it's, it's not the best example, honestly, um, but it's, it's, it's good enough, I guess. Um, I couldn't find a good picture um, of epiboli. And it can also get rid of hypergranulating tissue. Look at this picture on the left. Look at this hypergranulation tissue, how it's literally sticking out of the wound. That's not good. So when you use your silver nitrate on this, it burns it out. And of course, silver nitrate is used to stop bleeding as well. You gotta make sure your patient is not allergic to what? To silver, okay? Now, Santal is another chemical debridement. Um, it's, it's an enzyme and the and then we have lesson eight is about diabetic foot ulcers. Calluses. Calluses are very common around diabetic foot ulcers, like you can see in these pictures right here. Most neuro neuropathic ulcers are formed at the callus site, okay? Callus, what happens is the callus start building up and it results in a formation of an ulcer underneath it, almost like below the callus area that's not even visible to the examiner. So if your patient is diabetic and they have calluses, these calluses have to be shaved. Um, you do not want a patient with diabetes with really bad callus on their foot and just, oh, it's just a callus. No, it's not just a callus because a callus in diabetic foot ulcer could harbor an ulcer inside of it. These are the types of neuropathy in diabetic patients. These one, two, three types are important. Um, they will pop on the test, so just make sure you know what each one really mean. So autonomic neuropathy, that's when the patient's skin is very dry most of the time and the patient does not have sweat. Okay, and then lesson nine is about burns and how do you calculate burns? This is a quick slide about calculating TBSA. And you got to know your rule of nine in order to calculate your TBSA. So you cannot include the first degree burns in your TBSA. When you're calculating that, if the scenario is telling you the patient has first degree burn in one arm, you do not include that in your calculation of TBSA. You only include the second degree, third degree, fourth degree and up, okay? You do not include first degree. This is a very common mistake and the, they might try to trick you, but you're not gonna be tricked, hopefully. <laughs> um, so the rule of nine, if you look at this picture here, if the head is involved, if the head is burned, that you give it 9%, okay? If the entire one arm is burned, you give it a 9%. See how the arms are nine? Okay, and also this chapter include a um, couple scenarios where you, uh, it's showing the calculation and how do you calculate uh, the rule of nine and the TBSA. Lesson 10 is about the advanced wound treatment. And here's a quick um, slide about HBO complication. 
Now, this is a common complication that can happen in HBO, and the CWS exam likes this complication. So let's read this, for example, okay? If the patient is doing their HBO treatment and they're at the end uh, to ATI, ATA, and the patient became unresponsive, okay? And appeared to have clenched teeth, they, they are not having visible respiration. What do you do, okay? There are three things you have to do, and you have to do them in this particular order, okay? The first thing you gotta do is immediately switch the chamber to air, okay? This is the first thing to do. The second thing to do is observe and watch for spontaneous respiration. Your patient should start having spontaneous respiration. Once you see spontaneous respiration, then you do number three, which is depressurizing, okay? The depressurizing goes down to 1.8, okay? So the key here, do not depressurize the chamber to 1.8 unless you see spontaneous respiration, okay? A CWS exam tip is the most common side effect of H. All righty, and then we have lesson 11, it includes wound assessment, and here's a quick peek also. This might be on the test right here. Um, this is talking about oxandrin and prostat. Okay, this is oxandrin right here, and this is prostat. So oxandrin is prescribed for, for malnourished patients. What it does is, um, it is a muscle builder, okay? It decreases catabolism. It stops the loss of mass in severe wounds. It increases collagen synthesis, so it's, it really helps in wound healing. But before you prescribe oxandrin, which is this one, you gotta make sure the patient's protein level is good because you cannot just grow muscle if there is no protein in the body. So it also, in addition to this, you gotta order Prostat for your patient. Prostat is a protein supplement. It provides 15 milligrams of protein in a 30 ml. Alrighty, and that's it. That includes um, that concludes my sneak peek. So I hope you enjoyed it. And if you think this course might be helpful for you to pass the CW exam, you can click on enroll today. And I hope to see you soon.